Well, the last days are upon us. There's something about that statement that we identify with and kind of, right, that draws something from us because, you know, as believers, that means something. It means that eventually there comes an end to the wickedness we see around us. And because eventually wickedness is defeated, well, it's already defeated, but he brings a final end to it because Jesus comes to reign upon the earth and sets up his kingdom of righteousness. Boy, I look forward to that. You know, you, you see unrighteousness and even when there should be justice, there's, you know, justice either delayed or not there, or, you know, we see such injustice, but when Jesus comes, you know, it's not that there's not going to be any sin in the earth, but he's going to have a perfect kingdom. And when a, when a, someone commits an act of that sin, he's going to, well, his judges will be there and be able to have a righteous judgment and it'll be right there and it'll be perfect. We look forward to his kingdom, but until then, <laughs> we look to him and we, we trust in him. But, you know, before he comes, there's one thing we know as believers that, that the darkness is going to increase, that the wickedness is going to increase. You know, we have that expectation. It's clear from Isaiah 60 and verse 2, where he says, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep or gross darkness the people you know, that's what we can expect. Gross darkness com coming upon the earth. Uh, we've seen some pretty gross things happening in the world. But thank God the story doesn't end there because it continues. But the Lord will arise over you. I like this translation in the New King James. The Lord shall arise over you and his glory shall be seen upon you. Oh, we're looking forward to the glory of the Lord. You know, I think we can experience this now, the Lord arising over us and covering us. We can be hidden under the shadow of the Almighty. We're looking for an even greater portion of His glory being seen upon us, upon His church and His people. We long for that, to experience the glory of God, to be seen in us. You know, we have a few examples of that in scripture. Um, one of the most visceral, meaning the, the one that we, we see and we, we say, oh man, we want to see that in our day, you know, is, is in the Old Testament with Moses. Moses went up to the mountain and he would go into the tabernacle and he would come back and the glory was so powerful upon him that it, it's, it's like he absorbed it. You know, it, when someone goes by something that's radioactive, they actually absorb that energy. Of course, that's not good for us, but with the glory of God, it's like he absorbed it and people could see it upon him. Exodus 34, 29, Moses came down for the mountain. Uh, he had the tablets of testimony. Uh, he didn't know that the skin of his face was shining while uh, he talked with them and Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shines. They were afraid to come near him. They saw the glory. You know, that's a type. It's an example of God's glory upon uh, his people. It's, it was physically seen with Moses. Um, of course, the people at that moment were kind of in the flesh. That was around the same time with of the golden calf that they forged and then bowed down and worshiped. So they were, understandably, they were a little afraid of the glory of God upon Moses. Whoa, uh -oh, what's he going to do? Now, I realize this, this measure of the glory of God coming upon his people as he did upon Moses. I mean, that's rare in our day, right? We don't see a lot of people walking around with shining faces because of the glory of God. Maybe we need to. But, you know, you hear of little pockets of revival of God moving in certain places around the world, especially in church history. You hear of God moving in revival and it just stirs something in your heart. And, and we say, Lord, we believe you're going to do it again in our day. In the last days, you were going to come into that. 
but we realize we are not yet at that point. We have not surpassed that as a church of God's glory coming. I say surpass because that's an expectation we can have, right? The apostle Paul made that very clear to us. Second Corinthians three, seven, he said, but if the, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily on the face of Moses because the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? If the ministry of glory upon the, the Old Testament and upon the law was glorious, how much more will the ministry of the Spirit of God in our age be more glorious? You know, the law just pointed out sin. It just revealed how, how wretched we are. Um, you know, the law can't bring life. So Paul says, how much more glorious will the ministry of the Spirit of God be upon his people. I realize there's a spiritual connotation where, um, you know, Paul says a few verses later, we see through a glass darkly, like that, that in our lives, it's spiritually that God enlightens us and his glory opens our eyes and our, and the true experience will be in eternity when we behold the throne of God and the fullness of his glory. And we'll be around his throne for eternity. But the Bible also makes it clear that in the last days, his glory is going to cover the earth. Habakkuk 2.14, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, there's going to come a day when the earth is, it's not just going to be filled with the glory of the Lord, but the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Even the world is going to understand how glorious God is. And the people of God are who receive him and walk in that glory. You know, what position we take on that, on that glory, it kind of depends on how we act, how we react. I was thinking of, of uh, Israel and Egypt. You know, everyone beheld the glory, but the Egyptians had a kind of a different reaction. They saw the glory, but it was through miracles of judgment. A lot of the world, that's they're going to be their position. But then Israel, they saw the glory through miracles of preservation in the midst of judgment. You see, the whole earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, but it's, it's how we're going to relate to that glory that really matters. We want to be like the children of Israel. The glory of God comes upon us to preserve us. We'll talk more about that in, in a series. I'm starting a new series, by the way. Okay. This is this is about um, preparing for the last days that we want to look at some thoughts here. Uh, and so I wanted to consider with you some thoughts on how can we as the people of God be prepared for the last days? How can we make ourselves ready? Now, keeping in mind that what we're really speaking of is being prepared for eternity, because who knows the last days might be <laughs> sooner for some of us than others. None of us could know. We're in the hands of God. But really, it's how can we prepare for meeting Christ when he comes again for us? But yet we realize the last days are coming upon us. Now, in considering the second coming, we could look at lots of different places. We could look at different events in the scriptures like Revelation right? The, the judgments and the seals and the trumpets and vials. And we could look at Daniel and some of the images and the prophecies. We could look at Thessalonians or even in the Old Testament, we could look at Isaiah or Ezekiel or Zechariah. But you know, to get a whole picture of the events of the last days, really, I think one of the best places and where we have to look is what Christ shared with his disciples. And that's in Matthew 24. Because the disciples, they asked Jesus a specific question when he talked about the temple coming down. Well, he asked them a very specific question. They said, what's going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? What's the sign of the end of the age? And so Jesus shares a whole chapter telling the disciples and telling us, what's the sign 
of the end of the age. And, and so for this week, I just want to focus on the very first phrase or the very first words that Jesus gave to his disciples because they are such a key for us and a key for the last days. They're really an answer for the question, what are the events of the last days and how do we prepare? And so let's read that in Matthew 24 and verse 4. And Jesus answered his disciples and he said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and they shall deceive many. The very first thing out of Jesus' lips when he's talking to his disciples, what is, what's going to be the sign? And so in, in essence, when we think, how can we prepare? What can we expect? How, what can make us ready? Is that we take heed that no man deceives us. No man or no institution or nothing out there that speaking can deceive us into believing something that's not true. So we have to be careful what we watch, what we listen. We have to be actively examining whether we're, what is being said is the truth or not. not. Another important thing we are to notice is where this deception is coming from. It says, for many shall come in my name, in my name. You know, sometimes we think of deception well, the Antichrist and Satan are the deceiver. But, you know, sometimes we think, well, well, I'm looking for him. And we picture, you know, I mean, that's not really scriptural, but yet in our culture, we have this picture of Satan with a horns and a pitchfork and a tail. And it's like, well, I'm going to look for that. That's the, the source of deception. I got news for you. Our enemy is smarter than we, we think. He's not going to try and deceive us with that outfit on. He's going to try and deceive us from a position that we think is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Someone who comes, or at least they say they're coming in the name of the Lord, or they're coming from a position of truth. They're coming from a position that we would normally trust. It's not someone coming from the position of, I'm the Antichrist. Follow me. So what I want to uh, convey to you is that sense of wariness of where we might have a blind spot for deception is not from some person we think is the Antichrist out there. It's from someone who we, we think, hey, they're in our camp. Or they are in our, the same position that we are in or from our ideology or, you know, from someone we would agree with. The enemy is smart. He's not going to try to come at us from something we would definitely know is incorrect. Now, there's a lot we could say about deception, and we could talk about false doctrines, we could talk about wrong teachings, and, and all of that's true, and maybe we'll get into that in, in our series here, we'll, we'll see. But there's something that I, I think I've only mentioned this one other time in my history of all the sermons I've preached, but it's something that's been coming back to me uh, lately. I'm very hesitant to and want to be careful to speak on it, but it's the thought of conspiracy. Conspiracy. You know, it's the phrase that's been coming back to me, especially in the times that we're living in, is this thought of conspiracy. And there's something about our society. We like a good conspiracy, a nice juicy conspiracy. There's something in us that, you know, it's first off, it's a good story. It's something that's interesting. Sometimes the truth is just too boring. We need a good conspiracy. It makes it exciting anyway. The definition or a definition of conspiracy can be a theory that explains an event or a set of circumstances as a result of a secret plot, usually by a few powerful conspirators. We could mention a few, right? Some of the big ones out there, the ones that, you know, have been around for a long time, you know, Area 51, the conspiracy of alien landings, the JFK assassination, that's the magic bullet that went all over the place, um, the fake moon landings, 
right? There's people out there that believe we fake the moon landings as a, as a government. Or the, one that surprises me that I don't really get is this, is the flat earth, that the earth is really flat. There's a conspiracy out there. Where I don't know if they genuinely or they think, hey, this is fun to promote this. But, you know, those are just some some examples out there of conspiracy that, I mean, you know, you can talk about that and it's it it's not really engendering anything too dangerous or anything. Well, I, not that I'm promoting any of those things, but those are just some examples. They can sound appealing and it's exciting to hear and they make for good movie plots and that kind of thing. But, you know, we want to be careful of this concept of conspiracy. There's some things that can appear to be true. At least they sound appealing. They're exciting to hear. The, the real question is, is it true? There's another question we have to ask. What fruit is it going to produce? Is it true? But not just is it true, but what fruit will it produce in our lives? Paul had to warn his spiritual son, Timothy, about this concept. And he said this in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4. He said, neither give heed to fables or senseless stories, endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. It's human nature to focus on good stories, intriguing ideas, things that you never really can figure out, but they're interesting questions to talk about and, and so forth. However, there's some things we want to be real careful of because even if we, you know, we know we're not really sure we'll ever find out the truth or not, but yet what is the result of giving place to these things is are they, we have to ask the question, are they going to promote a lack of peace? What is the fruit that they will develop? Will they stir us up? Or will it promote, as Paul says, godly edifying? And Paul said to Timothy, if something is not going to build you up in your spirit, avoid it. But if something is edifying in the faith, do that. And my concern today for believers is there are a lot of things being said, claims being made from people who we would normally identify with but that we have to be very careful of accepting at face value because of the fruit that it will produce in our lives. There's things we need to test so that we are not giving place to things that are not unto godly edifying, but instead will produce fear. And that's something we have to ask ourselves because when you, when you think about some like a conspiracy theory, what, what is the end result that it makes you feel in your heart? You, just like, whoa, that's scary. If it's true, that's scary. <laughs> what do we do? Isaiah 8 and verse 12. I'll read this from the ESV. I had never considered this verse really quite like I saw it until I read it in this translation. It says, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Do not call conspiracy what other people are calling conspiracy. Because really, what, what are we doing? Do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. That's really what it comes down to. Because I, I believe the ultimate purpose of some of these things out there is to produce fear. Because And when we're fearful, we can be manipulated to do things we normally wouldn't do. Now, my goal here is not to delve into the political or current events. You know, we want the Holy Spirit to guide us in that. What I'm trying to do is to get our eyes on Jesus and to learn to trust in him in the midst of what we're experiencing, what we're seeing in the world. I have news for you. It's only going to get worse. <laughs> we're only going to see things that are going to be more and more concerning to us. 
And it's been hard because the problem is it's been so in our face lately in the political realm and current events. And I mean, there have been things concerning to us, rightly so. As believers, we're concerned about our nation. We're concerned about unrighteous laws being considered and promoted and, and so forth. We see the direction. But yet we have to be so careful as believers because we are first called to be citizens of heaven and to have our eyes upon the kingdom of God. We're to listen to what the Holy Spirit says, and we're to be very careful of allowing anything else into our spirits because it has an effect. We, see it, we saw that in Isaiah, the result was fear. And so the Lord is speaking through the prophet telling us, don't agree with what the people are saying with what they are calling a conspiracy, do not fear what they fear. If there's a message out there and you think, man, that's quite a message, examine your heart afterwards and say, did that cause godly edifying or did it cause fear to arise? That's one of the first things that we should be asking ourselves when we hear a message and, it, and, it, and remember, we're talking about God says the source is going to be from those who proclaim his name or proclaim the truth that identify in general with us. Maybe they're not be Christians, but they can something we would normally identify with. Or they could be Christians saying, listen to this prophecy. What is the fruit? We have to test what we hear. The enemy would love nothing better than to put a thought in our hearts and in our spirits that would make us afraid. And so we have to test those things. Uh, this is what the Apostle Paul said again, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Test all things. Test everything. And hold fast to what you know is good. Test everything. And hold fast to what you know is good. And really what good means is godly. What's edifying? What encourages us? What causes us to trust God? What causes faith to arise in our hearts? Hold on to that thing. If it doesn't do that, filter, the, filter it all out. It negates a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> but you know what? It only leaves us with peace. Another verse, Proverbs 14 and verse 15. This is scary. The simple believe every word they hear. Sometimes I'm worried for our nation because they're believing everything they watch on YouTube or whatever source they get. I mean, it used to be you'd watch like the main three or four networks and that's where you got everything from, but not anymore. There's a million sources out there. And we have to be so careful because the prudent person considers well his steps. And so the idea is that if we hear something that makes us or, or is asking us to change our way of thinking or our decision making, we cannot be rash in doing so. We have to consider it very carefully. Now, I'm not out there proclaiming that everyone, everything everyone says, you know, that's concerning is a conspiracy and, and is not true. There were conspiracies in the Bible that actually turned out to be true. And so the question, and I, there's going to be conspiracies in the last days that will be true. The Antichrist is going to have a conspiracy to get us all to take the mark. But the question is, how do we as believers react to these things that are concerning in the world, what are we to do? Well, let's look at someone who faced a genuine conspiracy and see, what did he do? This is in 2 Samuel 15 and verse 31. And here's David where his own son conspires against him. It's hard to imagine that. Well, Jesus told us that father, you know, son would hate father and father, son, and there would be division in families and so forth. And here David experienced that. Of course, part of it was a judgment 
against his house because of sin, but yet he still walked with God and he experienced this. And so 2 Samuel 15, 31, and someone told David saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. That's something else for, you know, you to be God's anointed and just trying to do what's right and people conspiring against you. And David said, oh Lord, what did he do? He just went right to the Lord. Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And it came to pass when David came to the top of the mountain, he worshiped God. That was his reaction. You know, Lord, I hear these conspiracies, but Lord, I trust in you. I worship you. Because really God's in charge. You know, David faced that, that, you know, a genuine conspiracy. Did he rage about what was taking place? There's a lot of rage out there. That's, that's, I mean, we understand why it is, but it's not the reaction that we should have as believers. When David heard about a conspiracy and, and it wasn't just some general thing out there, it was against him. He, when he heard of it there, he only looked to one place. He went up to the mountain and he worshiped God and he placed his trust and in other Psalms, it talked about how he laid down his head and he slept and he rested in God because he trusted in him. And that's, you know, David's kind of a picture of how we should be in the last days of walking with God, of trusting him. And so that's the place we need to come to when we hear troubling things, because as I said, uh, it, the last days, we're, we're only going to hear about one troubling thing after another with an increase in each one. We may even hear of those one day, that genuine conspiracy of thereafter believers. I just want to share a few scriptures, a few other scriptures as to the position we should take. You know, Paul shared in Romans 8, he shared a list of calamities that Christians can go through, some things we can experience. Thankfully, he doesn't call us all to experience it all at the same time, but you know, there's different seasons that we go through difficulties. And then he asks a question after listing all these things. He says this in Romans 8, 31. He says, what do we say to these things? What do we say about all the trouble and calamity that we can face as believers? Well, here's what he says. If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, we're, we'll, we're going to face all of these troubles culminating with the man of sin who has given the power to reign over the earth for a season. And he's even, even given power over believers who try and fight against him to overcome them. And we think, well, what can we do? Well, Paul says, but if God is for us, who can be against us? You see, that's the position God wants us to take, to fall back to, to rest upon. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Well, there's a conspiracy out there. Well, praise God, he's for me. So if that's against me, then they don't have a chance because God is on our side. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? What do we say about all the trouble we hear about out there? If God be for us, who can be against us? He knows everything we're going to face, everything that's going to come against us. And if he's for us, nothing can stand. One last set of verses. And I think this is my favorite in the sense of having a, a good position with God. In Psalm chapter two, Psalm two and verse one, the psalmist asks a question, but really this is God asking a question. Why do the na nations rage? Oh, there's more rage out there. Why do the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now we can expect that in the last days. We shouldn't be surprised if people are setting themselves up and pl even plotting 
against God and against his anointed and against his people. What do we do about that? Verse three. Well, he continues, and here's what they say. Let's break their bonds and pieces. We're going to cast away their cords from us. But then here's the reality. Here's the real situation in verse four. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. You see, there's going to be people making plots against believers. Well, the enemy is making plots against us now. He wants, us, he wants to trip us up. He wants to try and get us to turn out of the way. How does God see it? He sits in the heavens and he laughs at their effort. He laughs at their plan. You know, they're trying to thwart the plan of God that has already been written before the foundation of the world. And that is the biggest joke in God's sight to think that they can stop the plan of God. And that if we are aligning ourselves with the plan of God, we can be in on that joke. We can be with God. We can ascend to Mount Zion with him. We can be in, seat, seated with him in heavenly places, looking down at our enemies, laughing with him. That's the position that God's calling us to be. That's the perspective. That instead of being in fear at what's taking place, we can laugh and rejoice that we're in the palm of his hand and we don't need to be afraid. And so the last days are upon us. The question is, how do we make ourselves ready? What can we expect to see? Well, the very first thing Jesus says is, beware that no one deceive you. We can expect deception from the enemy the hard thing is, is that it, you know, we're looking at the enemy out there when the deception is coming from in here, from what we would, would not expect it from. We can expect deception. The enemy wants us to be in fear, to worry about the events of the last days. You know, sometimes you think about the last days and it's going to be like, man, what are we going to do when... All of that happens and we're persecuted and we can't buy or sell. You know, we're going to look over the next coming weeks at all of the things that God says that we should prepare and we should do. But, you know, in, in my reading of the Bible, I have yet to find one piece of advice where God says, you need to be concerned about what you eat, what you drink, where you're going to live whether you're going to have a roof over your head, you know, maybe you should make a cache and bury it in the ground, or maybe you should build a bunker and have it ready for the last days. He doesn't give any advice like that. All the advice he gives is that we get ready in here, is that we prepare our hearts, is that we learn to walk with him in meekness and righteousness and holiness in discernment that we learn to have his perspective that he's on our side but we're we beware lest anyone deceive us into thinking that he's not and that we need to be in fear that we worry about the events of the last days god wants us to have his perspective and what does he do he sits in the heavens and laughs and he's inviting us to sit with him and to to rejoice with him as he walks beside us through all of the events of the last days. And so let's endeavor to do that. Lord, give us your perspective to sit with you in heavenly places that we can endure to the end and overcome. Mm -hmm.